Hello. Today in this lecture, we are going to take a look at how to forecast financial statements. This is probably one of the most important transition from just understanding and using financial statement information to um, forecasting future earning potential of a firm and is the fundamental first step in um, valuation. First, let's take a look at the principles of financial statement forecasting. So remember that the objective of forecasting is to produce as close to realistic expectation as you can. Uh, we are trying to forecast future earnings, future cash flows and dividends, and then ultimately that will help us um, identify the potential future cash flows to an investment. So very important that we do not uh, we do not uh, indulge in wishful thinking. So we cannot choose a scenario. We have to be realistic. Um, it should be comprehensive. So therefore, we will have to cover earnings, cash flow, and also dividends or stock repurchase, as well as any change in, changes in assets. It also has to be in, internally consistent. So for example, it will be unrealistic to forecast exponential growth in sales with no need to purchase additional assets. So it has to be in, internally consistent. In order to support the growth in revenue, what kind of investment does a firm have to make in order to make sure that um, the, uh, the forecast of revenue can materialize? In addition to internal consistency, the assumptions also have to have external validity. So similarly, um, if a, a, a company is operating in a highly competitive market that is already saturated and they are projecting exponential growth, you have to ask, well, is that realistic? Can that really happen? Um, another uh, other external factors will include the state of the economy um, as well as industry specific um, factors. So the uh, forecast should project the firm's future operation. So that will be um, that will include um, um, revenue and operating. Um, costs. So this will include the uh, revenue projections has a lot of um, external factors that may affect it. And then the firm's operation is the firm's strategy. So um, the cost, again, talking about internal consistency, if a firm has um, stated that they have, they are expecting uh, lower than industry average costs because they're investing heavily in automation, then we would expect to have a high projection for investment in plant and equipment. So those are all integrated in operating, investing, and then of course the firm will have to pay for those investments. So if they say they're going to purchase $200 million worth of equipment, but they do not need to raise that money, they have to raise that money somewhere. Uh, if the forecast did not include that, um, again, that would be um, not consistent. So these are the principles. So whenever we make we um, we make an assumption, we need to make sure that uh, we carry the assumption through all the way from operation to investing to financing. And obviously, um, to do this kind of forecasting is very complex. Uh, the most common um, method is to use an Excel or spreadsheet modeling to do that. And there are also modeling principles that I will um, I will um, emphasize because financial modeling happened to be one of my um, research area and also my passion. So assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. Assumptions is very important. Your model is, your out, the output of your model is only as good as the assumptions that you put in. So all assumptions be very clearly stated and label accordingly. Do not, do not ever bury assumptions inside equations. And we'll go through a number of examples and you'll see um, how I will, how I can extract assumptions out of equations and put them as clearly as, as, as possible. That way, uh, your model can be used by somebody else. Um, and this is important if you are, uh, a lot of times um, analysts will share models with each other. Um, also, if you are pitching your, uh, uh, your company to a venture capital firm, 
for example, then the, the venture capital firm will want to see all those assumptions up front. They don't want to have to dig through your model and look inside the equations to see what your assumptions are. Area that will require user inputs should be separate from the model area. So financial statement uh, forecasting model is obviously based on financial statements. So we know all the formulas. We, we know how to create an income statement, a balance sheet, and statement of cash flows. Those formulas for those are covered in earlier chapters. Another thing to keep in mind is when you create a model, assume that changes will be needed. So design your model such that changes can be made very easily. And I'll show you uh, a few tricks as we go through today's lecture, uh, how that can be done. As you create a model, especially if this is a complex one, uh, you want to validate each subsection of the model. So for example, when you're creating the income statement, you want to check um, at the gross profit level, operating income level, um, taxable income level and net income. So after you finish each section, check to make sure that your formulas are working correctly. Uh, both from copying, if you change the assumptions, make sure that um, under extreme conditions, your model is still valid before you go to the next section. So do not create the entire model without testing it. Um, that will make your testing a nightmare. Finally, one of the main reasons that we create model is so that we can address, uh, address uncertainty. Um, so the best way to address uncertainty is to do sensitivity analysis, scenario, scenario analysis. Sometimes we'll even do break-even analysis. So as you design your model, keep that in mind. Create your model such that it will be easy to perform this type of analysis so that you can um, better understand um, how the uh, firm will perform under different scenarios so that you can take into account uncertainty about the future. For most analysts, um, the forecasting start with revenue, and I call that revenues-based forecasting. There are other approaches to forecasting, but revenues-based forecasting is 99.9 of the analysts will use this approach. So this is the one that we'll focus on in this class. So as the name suggests, we're going to start by forecasting future revenues. Uh, we're going to have a, we're going to do an overview of this and we're going to go into each segment um, in more details. Once you have revenues forecasted, then you will project operating expenses in order to support those revenues and also the operating expenses, as I mentioned before, uh, should be consistent with your firm's operating strategy. So whether your firm plan to be high, your firm ha uh, have a highly auto automated uh, operating process uh, that may mean more fixed costs versus variable costs um, and other industry characteristics. Once you have forecasted revenue and operating expenses, then you can compute operating income. So that's the first half of the income statement. And once you have that, you can project operating assets and operating liabilities. Um, and once again, those should be consistent with what you have um, projected in the first two steps in terms of revenue and expenses. So for example, operating assets, if you project a, uh, a certain level of revenue, then you may have to create, uh, you may have to obtain inventory, inventory, you may have to create accounts receivable in order to support the sales revenue. So those will be your operating assets. Uh, similarly, for operating liabilities, uh, the inventory will likely be supported by accounts payable. So all those things should be linked together. So, so far we have operating income and operating asset and operating liability. Now we have to think about how, we, how are we gonna, um, what will be needed to support, uh, to purchase um, or finance um, the operating assets uh, or net operating assets on net of operating liability uh, that we projected. 
So once we have um, an estimate of the financial liabilities, uh, we'll have uh, financing costs, so such as interest expense, and we can subtract that from operating income and the operating income. Once we have identified the assets, um, we can also compute depreciation. So uh, then we'll have taxable income, then we can estimate provision for taxes and then net income, and then equity distribution either in the form of dividends or share repurchase, and then retain earnings. Uh, in our first round, it is unlikely that our, our balance sheet will be balanced because we are, just, we are projecting this independently. Um, so we'll need a financial flexibility um, to make sure that the balance sheet is balanced. Uh, the term financial flexibility is sometimes called um, the PRUC, uh, depending on um, the school that you, uh, that you, um, that you belong to. So in uh, finance and accounting, we oftentimes call that the PRUC. Um, in, uh, in economics, uh, sometimes we also hear the term financial flexibility. Uh, this, is more, this is a more old-fashioned term. But in the industry, you may hear that a lot. That can, this can be in the form of loans, dividends, or new equity. So obviously, if your um, current financing um, or cash is higher than your needs, then you can pay out the excess as dividends or you can repurchase the stock. If the current um, financing is insufficient, then you may have to borrow additional money. Very, very seldom, unless in very extreme circumstances, will new equity be issued. So most analysts, when they do their forecast, they do not assume that new equity will be, will be, will be issued. Now, depending on your assumption and how you go about structuring your model, uh, you, the financial flexibility, if you use loan as the plug, then it may affect interest expense and interest expense is going to affect taxable income and net income. And because of that, you may end up uh, needing to borrow more money to pay for the, for, for the interest expense that you, uh, the higher interest expense that you now incur. Because of that, you may have to go through this process um, th through several um, iterations. If you use average value for the balance sheet in your estimates and in your model, you can actually even create a circular problem. Uh, and you'll see that in Excel. Now, you could eliminate this problem if you use either the beginning or the ending value instead of the average value. And whether or not that is a good idea depends on the firm. If the firms are experiencing very rapid change, meaning the beginning and ending value are vastly different, then you should use the average value, even though that will create a circular problem. If the, if the firm's beginning or ending value are not that different from year to year, then making the model more simple and eliminating the circular, uh, the circular reference situation would be preferred. So a, you'll find that a lot of financial forecasting is judgment. There are no rules. You, every situation is unique. Once you computed the balance sheet, the next thing is to cre uh, project a statement of cash flow. And that's the main process of forecasting financial statements. And then once you have computed that, then you can perform sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis, or even break-even analysis. Now that you know the overall picture, so this is like the roadmap of how to do um, financial statement forecasting, let's take a look at each component more deeply. First, let's take a look at revenues. Since revenues is the foundation for forecasting other financial variables, it's important to pay attention to it. Revenues are typically determined by sales quantity or number of units serve or number of units sold, and also the unit price. Industry analysis is the first step. It is important to understand what are the current industry conditions. 
that will obviously affect um, your volume forecast. Um, so usually there are industry groups that will put out industry-wide forecasts. Um, your base case may be that your, you expect um, sales quantity to increase um, at the industry-wide average. And then you may look at your company's past. Do you typically increase better than the industry or do you typically underperform the industry? Once again, do not fool yourself. If your company typically has a growth rate below industry average, maybe because of um, your unique geographic location or maybe because your firm decided to choose a higher price strategy, um, you want to take that into account. Another useful thing to look at is um, industry specific metrics. Uh, there are some common ones. So for example, uh, restaurants oftentimes look, use table turnover as the um, instead of number of plates sold uh, because each manual item is different price and have different costs. So restaurants typically just look at table turnover. So how many tables do you have times the table turnover? That's how many guests you have. And the unit price for a restaurant will be the average check per table. Uh, hotels use occupancy rate. Retail stores usually use a sales per square feet or sales per store. So those are industry specific. So once again, when you're doing forecasting, there are no specific or fixed rules. You have to really understand each industry. Therefore, it's very common for analysts to specialize in an industry. Once you have um, projected volume, you cannot, then you need to project price. Um, here it depends on the degree of competitiveness um, and industry capacity. So if the industry is highly competitive, then it's unlikely you can charge a very high price or you can raise price quickly. Uh, on the other hand, if you are operating in an industry where the capacity is, is nearing or is nearing capacity, then demand exceeds supply, then you, you can expect price to go up. Another thing, another factor that is important is the expected rate of inf inflation. They will affect your future price forecast. And also, if, um, if your, uh, a, a significant part of your sales is outside of your home country, then you also need to take into account the impact of exchange rates. Um, so, also, um, the two talking about internal consistency. If you expect, if your firm's strategy is to increase price, then it may affect the amount of uh, volume that you can increase. So, um, the ideal situation, of course, is to increase both price and sales volume, but that would be wishful thinking, right? Price and, and, and demand quantity are oftentimes in opposite directions. So we need to take that into account. Usually when we are working with an existing company, it is uh, it's a good starting point to use the past to project the future. Uh, particularly if revenue growth has been steady and all the other factors are stable, it is very, it is, um, this is a very good place to start uh, rather than coming up of your, uh, with your own unique estimate. So just a reminder, if you haven't done this in a while, growth rate is new divided by O minus one. Uh, even if you have unique factors and special circumstances that you want to incorporate, you can use historic revenue and growth as the base case. And then you can adjust for unique circumstances uh, given what the current economic industry or firm, or firm specific factors are um, in play in the forecast period. One last reminder, if you are projecting revenue for a cyclical firm, cyclical means that the firm sales goes up much higher during an expansion and it goes down much greater during a recession. Um, that's more difficult because it is more volatile. So when things are good, you'll go good and when things are bad, you'll get worse. So they'll require you to forecast what the future economy is. Uh, and that is a very, very difficult thing to do.
Once we have revenue, next is to project uh, operating expenses. So expenses typically can be classified into variable costs. These are costs that change proportionally with revenues. Uh, examples are direct labor and direct materials. Um, and then there are fixed costs. These are costs that do not change. Um, I want to emphasize that we just expect this not to change within the forecasted time period. Uh, in the long run, everything is variable. Um, uh, an example will be rent. Uh, a lot of companies may have signed a lease and um, the rent may have a either a billing clause or it may not change for the next two years. So that then if your forecast period is next year or two years, uh, it is possible of actually quite likely that rent may re re uh, remain the same. Uh, step cost. Uh, expenses that has a fixed component as well as a portion that vary with sales. So for example, web hosting, if you are e-commerce site, uh, a lot of web hosting contract will have a fixed cost or fixed price plus um, a usage rate. So um, uh, that would be an example of step cost. So when you're projecting operating expenses, um, as a percentage of revenue, uh, take into account not all costs will change direct proportionally with revenue. Um, and another thing to take into account too is those percentage could change. So uh, even for example, direct labor and, and cost material uh, that could change given the current econ or forecast economic condition. So whenever those uh, always take into account external factors. I just want to iterate over and over again, there are no fixed rule in forecasting. Judgment is extremely important. So more important is that as you develop your forecast, write down those assumptions very clearly so that even if um, the, your forecast turn out to be off, which is more likely than not, you understand which assumption um, did not hold, did not turn out. Um, for example, we recently have COVID-19. If you make a forecast at the end of 2019, um, you will find that a lot of your assumptions um, will be altered. So your forecast will, will, be, will, be, um, will not uh, coincide with what actually happened. So instead of saying your forecast is wrong, it's that your forecast is off. That's a, that's a much better way to look at it. But if you consistently make the same error, for example, then you can improve your forecast by realizing that, for example, you need to pay more attention to industry condition because your industry assumptions are what is oftentimes off. So in terms of um, which cost do you choose to um, be a variable which cost do you choose to be fixed it um, that this is just one approach let's say cost of goods so you determine that's mostly variable cost so you're going to forecast it as a percentage of revenue uh, but as in sgna so sales and administrative um, those are more like an overhead and they may not increase um, as sensitive to sales, uh, but they definitely will increase with inflation. So this, this is just an example of how you would um, separate cost forecasting. Uh, some firms report depreciation and R&D as separate line items. Not all firms do that. So uh, depreciation typically will not change uh, unless uh, additional plant and equipment are purchased. So you can uh, forecast depreciation as a function of increase in total asset uh, instead of um, revenue. So if you have additional detail, you can um, you can then um, get a more precise forecast. Now that we have pro uh, projected revenues and operating expenses, we can compute uh, operating income. In the next video, we'll continue with um, projecting operating assets and liabilities. See you soon.